You're listening to Sustainably Geeky, the podcast for everyday environmentalists. Hi, you're listening to Sustainably Geeky, episode 57. Today, we are starting out the new year, 2023, a little differently than our other shows. And um, normally, I would have one or two guests on um, to talk about a specific topic that they work on in their daily lives or that they've studied. And today, I'm actually, I've got a couple friends here to talk about our experiences with trying to live more sustainably. And I thought this would be a good topic because... um, you know, everyone listening to the show is probably interested in ways to reduce their carbon impact and, you know, kind of um, consume less in some ways. But I think um, there's a lot of frustration in a lot of the things that we're expected to do that we don't always talk about. And I thought it would be good to get a few other people on that, you know, have also experienced this so we can hash it out and see, you know, what everyone else is experiencing and maybe let others know that they're not alone in the frustration or the confusion. Um, in trying to, you know, be a good environmentalist. So today I am joined by Chris, who many of you will remember from the beginning of the show and previous episodes. Um, Chris is a friend from Canada and she has been on a sustainability journey for many years. Yeah, a long time. I went to college (laughs) for this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I'm excited to hear her her take because she's had a little bit different journey than me and she'll have a lot of interesting Um, things to say. And I've also got Rachel on and I met Rachel in Ireland when I went for grad school last year. Um, And Rachel and I, I think are equally passionate about a lot of these things. We've had many um, (laughs) fraught conversations about (laughs) what what we, yeah, like what we want to do, what we want to see the world do. But um, yeah, I thought Rachel would have a lot of interesting things to say as well. So welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this, like I said, kind of came about a few months ago when Chris and I were talking after another show about like, what if we did a show about, you know, being a bad environmentalist and we don't, what we mean by that is like, we don't think people should not try at all, but we also realize that there's a lot of guilt that comes along with a lot of the things we're expected to do. So uh, we want to dissect that a little and say, you know, maybe the things we're expected to do are either unrealistic or, um, we don't actually have to do as much as, as people say. So um, I can start us out. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up after living in Ireland for almost a year um, was public transit. So a lot of times uh, we hear that taking public transit is the ideal way to reduce your carbon imprint um, because it does you know, um, mean that more people are taking one vehicle and you're not putting more carbon in the air by driving your own vehicle. And while I love that concept, (laughs) having to take the bus for many months to get around a city that was, I'd say it was somewhat walkable, right, Rachel? I (laughs) walked everywhere. Yeah, (laughs) it was pretty walkable. I got so many steps in when we lived there. It it was more walkable than where I live now. Um, But sometimes you need need to take the bus if you're carrying a lot of stuff or it's raining or you just, you're tired or whatever. Um, I will say it wasn't like the best experience ever. There were a lot of drawbacks. Um, So that's what I want to talk about is like if it is raining all the time and you're having to walk to the bus stop and wait, you know, in the rain or wait for the bus to get there and it's running late, um, that can be frustrating. And then if you have a lot of stuff to carry or, you know, if you're even if you're walking, like walking is also um, put forward as a very green way to get around. That can be frustrating when you have a lot of things. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of torn on that one because I, I definitely value public transit in places where it's available, but I did miss my car a lot of times. <laughs> I wasn't driving over there, and there were times when I was like, well, I can't buy this at the grocery store because I can't carry it, or you know, I don't want to have to call a taxi just to take me home to yeah. get all of my groceries. So in that way, I have to make multiple trips. And yeah, so what do you ladies think? What are your experiences with public transit or your thoughts? Oh, man. I feel like that's so location dependent. Yeah. Um, obviously, it is something that can be improved even where we were living in Ireland. That being said, that was so much better than anywhere else that I've lived, you know? So <laughs> there were times when the buses are late or, or they didn't come. And yeah, if you're raining, you're sick or you're, you're carrying stuff, you know, or you have an appointment, you have to be there at a particular time. That can be really difficult. I know, especially for you coming to school, that was a factor with mm-hmm. making sure you're taking an earlier one. Because if it doesn't show up, you know, they exactly. still have time. So definitely really valid points. And the airport. 
That's a big one. I had trouble with that. Yeah, yeah. Going to Dublin airport was fine for me, but to go to any of the local airports, mm-hmm. not having a, a public transit system that accommodated the flight times, that yeah. was definitely a, a little bit of a, a difficult point there. But it was just so much better than so many American cities too, mm-hmm. which is a difficult thing. If Where I was living in Arizona previously, love it, but you could not take public transportation anywhere because it's a half mile walk to the nearest bus stop and it's over 100 degrees there Fahrenheit all the time so and it might run once an hour if you're lucky yeah especially it's every 30 or 60 minutes it's really difficult to be able to get anywhere really that easily so it's I think it's a great concept but I think Mm -hmm. it's a lot more public funding and support to be able to actually make it a viable everyday alternative for people Mm -hmm. yeah I definitely think public transit is is great but things like weather make it not so great, like extreme heat or up where Chris is, if it's snowing or raining, it's, it's really miserable to have to walk even, you know, a quarter of a mile or something down the street to get to. And like the days that I had to lug my suitcases to get on a bus, to get on another bus, you know, that was, that was a little rough. So I don't know, Chris, what is your experience with public transit up there where you live? Well, I have lived in rural Ontario my whole life in different parts of Ontario and we have nothing (laughs) there's nothing (laughs) um Toronto is the closest city it's also the largest well it's not the closest city but it's the largest city in Canada and its transit system blows chunks so you know we have a massive country it's relatively new our our just our to get to one end of the country to the other is an absolute nightmare super expensive um like smaller cities have their own local bus system, but they're not interconnected in any way. Um, there's a go train near Toronto, but the, it only goes to certain greater Toronto area areas. So you can't even catch it where I am. Uh, not even a little bit. There's a shuttle that comes once a week to take you to Toronto if you want. Uh, so when Ray and I went over to England, we were just like, holy crap. This is amazing. <laughs> Every corner has a... Every, are you kidding me? Like, and as <laughs> somebody who's never lived in Europe, who's, I was very rose-tinted, obviously, about the whole thing. We just thought it was freaking amazing. Um, yeah, the transit system here in Canada is terrible. We have a pretty... We don't have a great premier of Ontario right now. He's trying to make this massive highway through a green belt, which would only serve one spoke of the GTA. It doesn't make any sense, but he's like... <laughs> For his constituents, he's got to make this giant stupid highway through a marshland. Um, So, yeah, it is not. It's not great here. It's never been great here. You have to have a car. North America is just not It's not set up. No. And then you've been up where we are, Jen. So, you know, I mean, we don't live that rule anymore. We've moved since Mm -hmm. since then. But um, you have to have a car. I tried once. We tried once when the kids were smaller to have one car because we lived in a you know, a town with about 9,000 people so I could get around with my bike and the little cart in the back for the kids. But that was like six months of that. And it was enough of that. Had to get yeah. another car. Well, that's a good point too. Yeah. If you don't have, if, if you have kids that yeah. presents more challenges as far as coordinating. Oh, absolutely. Schedules and things. Um, yeah. But yeah, Rachel, you're right. Like public transit is very location specific. And I think we had it pretty good in Galway. Although, uh, the people there, you know, complained about it nonstop about how. Yeah, but that's because they haven't lived. Yeah, or... that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I was like, uh, come to Texas because we had nothing. Yeah, so. I mean, honestly, I all dependent. did not miss not having a car at all. I loved that if, I, if we wanted to go to the like national parks on further along on the West Coast, I can just hop on a bus. I really felt like longer hauls throughout the country were very doable by bus or only a few places where it was like, ooh, this is really just much easier, you know, if we had a car. Um, I just think it's kind of that day-to-day, like yeah. we're just saying, like, if you've got to schlep children and mm-hmm. their jackets, and, you know, once you start having to haul a bunch of things, I could see that being a little bit more of a difficult situation. Me just living my best, like, single student life, <laughs> it's much easier, so. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed having that um, available to me and, you know, having made the decision not to drive in a country that drives on the other side of the street and drives mostly manual and, you know, narrow streets and all these things, plus the expense. I was like, 
I'm just not going to do it. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely grateful that they did have what they had. It was just, there were times when I was a little bit like, okay, this is, I'm over this, like <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, overall, I think we're told that, you know, we have to, um, use public transit or walk or use bikes and the infrastructure is not always there. So uh, that's, that's something that, you know, the system needs to be a little more better prepared for, I think, in order for all of us to be able to do it. Like mm -hmm. that's the difference between the American and the European example is Europe was built on much more human scale, walking scale mm -hmm. levels. So, and then with America, and I'm sure Canada has a lot of similarities here too. There's such vast distances and it really was so designed for highways and cars. Mm -hmm. And so then to say, use public yeah. transit, like, yes, that would be phenomenal. But like you said, that infrastructure needs to be in place to support those kinds of distances. Mm -hmm. to have that regularity and consistency with the schedules. And that's just not something that we have, certainly on a national level, that's really yeah. just in your own lo local area, if your local government has decided to invest in that or not. So it's, it's really, yeah, mm -hmm. I, we, we've said it before, but <laughs> location dependent, really. Yeah. And even riding a bike, I would have yeah. loved to be able to ride a bike in a lot of places, but I don't feel safe or I don't feel like there's enough lanes or the drivers aren't educated enough. Even in Galway, so many people rode bikes and I admire them for it, but it looked terrifying to me with some of those <laughs> roads. And yeah, I can imagine Chris trying to do that with kids. It's like <laughs> next uh, level. Th four or five months out of the year, it's pretty great. Mm -hmm. Um the rest of the time because it's you know gets cold and snows and stuff and they you know all the yeah. accoutrement that they come with when it gets colder and riding in the snows it's just ridiculous so you don't ride a bike in the snow <laughs> stupid you put chains on your snow tires <laughs> exactly. or your bike tire <laughs> big fat moon tires for oh freaking bike well um who else has an example of something that they've tried and it wasn't all it was cracked up to be or they just ended up feeling kind of guilty for not being able to, you know, fully implement. Um, yeah, I'm glad that you brought up this feeling of guilt with some of these things, because as anybody out there listening who cares about trying to improve our environment or at least not make things worse, I think that's definitely something that comes up for me. So I'm just going to project that out to all of you that that's probably there for everyone else as well. Um, I know I have a lot of guilt over the tiny little plastic things that I bring into my home. And I've tried so, so hard to minimize the amount that I bring in. And that brings me into my kind of angsty topic for the day is recycling. Um, and I just want to just caveat everything I'm about to say with people still please recycle to the best of your abilities. This is not meant to discourage anybody from doing it. It's still better to do it than to not. Um, but I definitely was kind of socialized to feel that if I'm recycling, then I am doing the good things I need to do. I have eliminated my little individual footprint and things will be well. And when I had the realization of, oh, actually everything that I put in the recycle bin is not 100% all recycled. I mean, it just, I felt like a bomb had gone off in my soul. <laughs> so um, a couple of things I wanted to bring up on that is literally what we were just saying again with with the public transportation question is the localization of your recycling ability. Because, you know, at least on plastics, they've got the little recycling symbol and the numbers one through seven on there. And most people see the symbol and assume this means that it's gonna be recycled. And that's actually usually not the case. Typically only numbers one or two can be managed by your local recycling center. But depending on where you live, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's not okay. It could be a few miles down the road. If you move, it could be a completely different recycling center. And it's literally all just dependent on what equipment is at that facility that it's going to go to. It could be wildly different. So the lack of consistency, I think, is a big challenge to even knowing what can I put in the recycling in this location versus in this other location. So you've already got most plastics that you're not going to be able to put into the recycling. And then even if it is a plastic one or two, if, if it's too small, sometimes the equipment can't process it either. So then it has to be a certain size. And that is where some of my guilt comes in is a lot of beauty products or little takeaway sauces and things come in those tinier containers that are just too small to be recycled. And I do spend a lot of time trying to find alternatives that don't use those materials. And 
you know, if you have the time and you have the money to do that and then you have stuff shipped to you, like good for you. But then if you're shipping stuff, you know, are, are you offsetting the good you're doing with the packaging by having, you know, then the footprint of the shipping. So then you get into like, can I not do anything right? Um, so it's a drawback to everything we do. <laughs> but well, sometimes, honestly, it can start to feel that way. Definitely. Um, and it's not, I mean, plastics obviously is kind of a, a low hanging fruit for that. Cause I think we're all pretty aware of that being a significant problem, but honestly, there's a lot of even paper goods that don't all get recycled. And, you know, so even, even if you've put, like picked the exact correct thing for your recycling facility and it's gotten there, that doesn't necessarily mean it will be recycled. A lot of items are still burned or sent to a landfill or, Jennifer, you and I talked a lot about this over the last year, but a lot of things are shipped to other countries mm -hmm. um, in what I would call the majority world, but like global south is a term that's often used um, or like developing countries, another term that you might often hear referred to some of these places. So we basically sell these things to these countries and let them kind of deal with it. And then they have huge landfill stacks or little landfill mountains um, as a result of our trash, um, not just paper or plastic, but also electronic waste is a huge, you know, contributor to those kinds of little landfill mountains. Um, so just not like knowing that a lot of this stuff isn't actually getting put back into a use cycle. That was like a really demoralizing, I feel like moment for me when I finally understood that that was maybe not as rosy as I, I thought it was. So I mean, it is still important to do your own individual part and the recycling situation is a lot more nuanced than I've put it in the bin and now everything is peaches. Um, that kind of makes me think about, you know, in school there was, you know, the reduce, reuse, recycle, banner, kind of those three. Um, and I feel like the reduce aspect is where my guilt comes in for how much stuff I do bring in that I don't want to. And it's also the aspect where I feel like a lot of the onus is being placed on the individual without that necessarily being realistic. If I, as a consumer, want to buy a plastic alternative, I'm really dependent on what is out there in my community for how feasible that's going to be for me. Maybe I live near a grocery store that has a bulk non-perishable you know, spot in their store, or maybe I have a grocery store that's got alternatives to plastics in their store, um, like some compostable bags and things like that. But if I don't, then I'm kind of a lot more limited in, in how I can access a lot of those resources. Mm -hmm. So that's something where I feel like regulation and policy at the local or state governmental level is so critical to providing that support to the consumer to be actually be able to reduce what they're bringing in and how much they're using. So I don't, I don't know if you guys have also <laughs> experienced that lack of community support or examples when there's been positive community, community support. But that's something that I, that I see that is like, well, we, we can't really just do that only on the individual level and have that work out, really. Well, and yeah, I was going to say exactly what you said, Rachel, like the other two R's are always forgotten. You know, it's always about recycle. That's what's pushed mm -hmm. on the consumer. Yeah. And I would venture to say that, that that reducing and reusing are even more important, but recycling is the easy way out, right? So I'll, I think that was pushed on us at an early age as, oh, well, you can use as much as you want as long as you recycle it, which yes. just feeds <laughs> into consumerism and all that. But also, um, it's just like, I, I, yeah, I've, I've seen people say, well, if I get this, you know, it's going to be recycled anyway, so it's fine. And um, it just, yeah, it kind of creates that false sense of security and the other thing is, you know, like, why aren't, why aren't the companies producing things that don't need to be recycled or why aren't they, or not that they don't need to be recycled, but that are less waste intensive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they used to use glass for a lot of bottles and those had a deposit scheme, but then they switched to plastic because it was easier and cheaper for them to tell the consumer they were doing wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like all these things out there that, yeah, it's like our fault. We have to do it. And Meanwhile, the companies get away with kind of like, you know, whatever they want, whatever's better for their bottom line. And like you said, some some regulation would go a long way with that stuff, I think. <laughs> well, and you hit the nail on the head there with their bottom line. If they create a single use product, that means that next time you need anything of that product, you have to go buy it from scratch again. And they make more money that way. If you could just continue to reuse the things you already have, you're not buying new all the time. So it's mm -hmm. Capitalism as part of recycling is, yeah, it's not helpful. 
Um, I will say the reuse aspect of it, I feel like is a little bit, I don't know, easier on the individual. Um, not that there's not still a community support that needs to be in place for that. But at least for reuse, I feel like there's a few more options available at an individual level to leverage. It's a little tough because you kind of have to know that those resources are there. And if you don't happen to know about it, you know, then you're a little bit out of luck. Um, I have been really surprised to learn how many people I know actually try to do reuse and are in groups like I recently learned about buy nothing communities. Mm -hmm. where You're not selling or buying items. It's just hey, I have this thing that I'm no longer using or I'm in search of this thing. Would anyone like to just have it for free? And it's just a no money mm -hmm. exchange kind of a, a system. Um, and that's been wonderful for me because as we were kind of getting into earlier, I just moved from Ireland. And then as soon as I moved from Ireland, I moved from States. So I've just been doing nothing but schlepping and, and moving the past <laughs> few months. Um, so I have just an obscene number of cardboard boxes because you know, my book collection obviously isn't going <laughs> to shrink, so I'll just find more boxes to move them around with. Um, you know, and then I just looked at this mountain of boxes and thought like, oh man, I do not want to chuck these all in the recycling bin. Not all of them are going to be recycled. They're all in good shape. What am I going to do with these? And so my friend got me connected with a buy nothing group in my local community, which is nice because the point is to get to know people who are basically your, your neighbors that are in your community. So there's a cohesion aspect to that as well, which is nice. But it was great because I was able to give all of my boxes to people who were themselves moving and really didn't want to have to go buy new boxes for this one experience. So being able to leverage that community connection has been really great. And then obviously because I was moving, now all of my social media algorithms, you know, picked up on it unfortunately, after the fact and notified me that there's actually companies now where you can just rent crates for your move and then return them when you're done. So you don't have to buy, you know, a thousand boxes and then repurpose them after you can maybe just borrow these actual crates from somebody and then return them to the company after the fact. So, but that's not something that I knew about, you know, earlier. And I haven't, you know, I haven't tried that program yet since I just accomplished my move already, but I mm -hmm. feel like there are things if you can find them like that. Yeah. They can help you with that reuse cycle, you know, thrifting and secondhand is great. My entire living room is now furnished exclusively with secondhand furniture I got nearby. That's all fabulous and cheaper and nicer, frankly. So mm -hmm. I feel like that has a little bit more opportunity for the individual, but you do still need that community network to have secondhand shops and to have buy nothing groups and to have these businesses available to you that you can, I guess, kind of loan out items that you need. Yeah, those are great resources. Social media for all of its, you know, negative aspects is good for um, helping to connect people that, are, you know, just need things or want to get rid of things. Like we've given away a lot as we've cleaned out the house and I got all my boxes through Facebook for free. So those are those are positives of social media. <laughs> so tough. I'd love to get rid of all my social media, but then I can't leverage a lot of these <laughs> helpful things that I really want to be a yeah. part of. I feel very, <laughs> very yeah. torn. But there are positive resources out there for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Chris, did you have anything to add or did you want to um, throw another topic out there for us? Uh, um, I agree with what Rachel's saying. You have to have the community there or it's sort of you against a big mountain of mm -hmm. nothing, right? So, I mean, we have them here too. We have, you know, buy nothing groups and Facebook. Um, we got rid of our moving boxes through Facebook Marketplace. Um, and that was really great too. Cause it was, again, I was like, what am I going to do with all these freaking boxes? And, um, recycling is a very frustrating thing too, because it's like kind of like a little pat on the back, but it's like not enough. There's this really great quote. It's like recycling is a good place to start, but a bad place to stop. Ooh, I like that. So yeah. yeah. So I always try to remind myself that because since COVID, you know, everything kind of all of the um, reusable programs that were around kind of went out the window because of health reasons, which is totally fine. And I totally understand. Um, but it's not that hard to get back into single use stuff and it's because you have to add a necessity. So now like almost three years <laughs> on, um, starting to now be like, okay, so you take an audit of your house. What do we got to do? Mm -hmm. to get the recycling down because we have a big giant bin that comes every other week but 
and there's four of us living here, but man, do we, we, it's like a sport to see how fast we can fill it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, totally. Yeah. Recycling is a bit one, one of those things where it's great when it's great and crap when it's not supported properly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I was going to mention was um, veganism and I, bless my family. They put up with a lot of my shenanigans. Um, <laughs> So, uh, several years ago I got diagnosed with high cholesterol and one of the things that's supposed to be good for your heart and everything like that is to reduce your meat. Well, I already live with two people who can't eat red meat. Um, so we don't, we don't really eat it all that much. And then I'm like, okay, well, like, let's try this vegan thing. I read a book about blue zones and I'm like, okay, let's do it. And uh, wound up getting blood work done about three months later and I did it with the kids too. And both mine and my daughter's iron were so low, we were borderline anemic. And, um, it, I'm convinced now, uh, that unless you have some sort of degree in nutrition or dietitian or something like that, um, you're SOL because, it's veganism is such a hard thing to get right and really easy to get wrong. And we're telling, you know, plant-based is best. Look at all these new plant-based products that are out. A lot of them are really highly processed. Mm -hmm. And because I have high cholesterol, I can't have trans fat. Um, and I, that means I can't eat beyond meat. That means I can't eat impossible burgers. Um, they're all full of their, they have trans fat in them because of the, how processed they are, which is really unfortunate and breaks my heart. I just can't eat them. So eating meat is better for me and my family. Our number, our hemoglobin and our iron has gone back up. Um, we predominantly eat chicken because my husband and my son are both allergic to red meat and, um, we feel better. Do we cut back a lot? We only have meat maybe once this week's pretty heavy, but usually it's about two to three times a week and it's usually just dinner. Um, but yeah, veganism is one of those things where it's touted as saving the world. And it's like, you have to be very careful with your health because if you develop a, a B12 deficiency, you can destroy the nerve endings in your fingers and your feet if you don't supplement properly. Um, if you already are subjective to low iron, you can make yourself anemic if you don't get enough iron rich foods or if you're supplementing. And unfortunately, plant based iron and uh, animal-based iron are very different and they're absorbed very different in the body. Um, so just knowing that, and if you're talking to a homesteader, um, they will tell you pound for pound, calorie for calorie, animal products are much better for the homestead, for your family than plant-based because it's so plant-based is so much more intensive and labor intensive and it requires more land for, for a little bit of return. So the more I've gotten into it, the more I'm like, we mostly plant-based, but mm -hmm. we're not vegans because it was yeah. very unhealthy for us to be vegans. Well, yeah, and I think that's a good point, Chris, is like, um, I know that there's a big movement to eat plant-based and it, they make it sound like it's everyone can do it, but it's really not right for everyone, right? Like it depends on your health needs and your lifestyle and a lot of different factors. A lot of times it's money, like those things can be expensive and yeah. um, accessibility is a big part of all this. And it's so like me personally, I have actually struggled with the guilt of not being a vegan or a vegetarian because, um, you know, of all the, the reasons we're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I understand the impacts and I definitely want to at some point I strive to become at least vegetarian, but I don't, I know that my lifestyle at this point, it would cause my mental health more anxiety mm -hmm. than, than I would, you know, get out of it, I guess, or, yeah. or feel like it offset the guilt, if that makes sense. So um, for me, that's a trade off I'm not willing to make right now. Like I know my limits that I'm like, you mm -hmm. know what, I'm doing a lot of other things. And this is something that I just have to accept that right now I can't, I can't fully do that, but I do try to limit and minimize. So if there is a vegetarian option or if there's a way I can, you know, substitute, I might, you know, do that more than I would have five or 10 years ago. Cause I'm conscious of, okay, well, I think if we all just minimized 
how much we ate yeah. instead of just going cold turkey. Um, that would make a huge difference too. Oh yeah. It's the minimization because the North American diet is seriously yeah. animal product heavy and that's not good for our bodies either because it clogs stuff up and there's a whole lot of diseases associated with not eating great, but also veganism doesn't necessarily equate health either because mm -hmm. Oreos are vegan, <laughs> you know, like, and, uh, a lot Sugar's of vegan, vegan. <laughs> pardon? Sugar's vegan. <laughs> Sugar's yeah. vegan. Well, well, sort depending of. on the sugar brand, vegan, well, yeah. brand because of bone char and all that stuff. But, uh -huh. um, but that's what I mean. Right. And then you have all these different offshoots of veganism. There's the raw vegans. There's the whole vegans. There's the starch. And you're like, holy crap. Like, and they all hate each other. Like none of them, nobody's supportive of anybody in that movie. They're gangs. Yeah. And it's really hard to find just a space where you're not being judged for eating sugar or deciding you were going to have those potato chips, even though they're processed or decide whatever. Um, but a lot of vegan food out on the market now is pretty heavily processed. And if you have an out like for people with lactose intolerance or dairy allergy, this is like great because there's so many wonderful alternatives. Um, and that's fantastic too, but you have to be really careful and do a lot of research, get your blood work done. If you're considering it, um, please, because that was a big thing I wish I would have done, especially with my kids because they, because I'm, I buy the groceries and do all the cooking and stuff. They were sort of subjected to my experiments. And <laughs> while we learned a lot, um, yeah, we're just, I do believe some bodies are totally built for it. Absolutely. They could totally thrive and it's amazing and they feel wonderful on them. But I feel like a good population chunk of the population is not meant to be strict vegans. Vegan day, have a vegan day, a <laughs> couple of days, but yeah. Meatless Monday. Yeah. That's such a good point though. Like it, sometimes it can feel like you have to do all or nothing and if you're yeah. not all, then you've like mm -hmm. failed in your efforts for sustainability and that yeah. be so hard oh, to yeah. stay motivated to, to try. So what you two have been talking about with having that moderation or limiting things a little bit, I think it's important to recognize that yes, we should do what we can do, but then also to give ourselves grace if you know what, this one particular thing is just going to be a step too far for me to do right now. Mm -hmm. Like, that's okay. Do what you can do. Don't beat yourself up over not being able to take this next step in this other topic and just keep working for it. Yeah. Bit. Do what you can. That's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like at the end of the day, the points don't matter. Right. Like you're going you know? <laughs> so if, if you can do it, but if you can't, that's okay too. I, and I really mourned that. I really wanted to be a vegan. I was like, yes, this is it. My heart's telling me I need to. And then the rest of my body was like, oh, you're funny. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. So, um, yeah. And it is also really hard socially as well if you do not have a community around you who's vegan. Because there's a lot of misinformation a lot of people don't understand. Or they have their own biases and fears and stuff like that too. Which is, you know, most of the time it's really warranted. But, yeah, it can be hard to... To keep it up if you're in a in a space where it's not supported too. But yeah, I've tried veganism, can't do it. Reduced it a lot, like reduced our meat intake a lot, but we've we've settled on our family diet and we're pretty good with it. Yeah. Sometimes it's trial and error, you know. Oh yeah. Whether it's that or any any of the things we're talking about, figuring out like like Rachel said, what works for you and what you you mm -hmm. just have to be able to deal with kind of um well um for my next one I guess I'll kind of talk a little bit about um <laughs> over the pandemic I kind of got into gardening and um this is when I had my own house and I had a um, little more expendable income and I you know kind of went all out and building garden beds and buying the many supplies you need for it. And it was fun. I, I enjoyed it. Um, but you know, it, you know, gardening is put forth as, is a very environmental way to live because you're providing, you're growing your own food. It's more local. You'd save money eventually after you recoup your, you know, whatever amount of money you put into the actual garden. So your first tomato is like $200 or something. <laughs> this is a joke, but, um, but you know, I, I have to say it wasn't all fun and games for me because I kind of found it stressful, um, living in Texas and, 
having to constantly water or make sure that there was a timer on and um, just the upkeep of, you know, being out there pulling weeds and I'm working full time and I'm constantly having to like do once there's always steps, right? There's like, okay, you have to plant the seeds at this time of year and then you have to go out there and, and, you know, do this maintenance or that maintenance. And there's, there's just like so many different, um, chores that need to be done. I'm not saying it's, it's impossible, but it, it was a lot of work for me personally. And I didn't get as much joy out of it as maybe some others. Um, so I think if I did it in the future, I would definitely scale back because I tried to do way too much and I would take into consideration that I live in Texas and uh, it's too hot to do it without a system like a, a watering system because you just can't get out there twice a day all the time to water it by manually. And yeah, um, that was my experience though with gardening. I, I liked it, but probably bit off more than I could chew. <laughs> I have so much sympathy for you with that one. When I was living in Arizona, I had such wild dreams of cultivating herb gardens. And I cannot tell you how many like basil and rosemary plants just were absolutely butchered as part of that process. And it was so, so sad. Um, <laughs> I had a neighbor who was just a phenomenal desert gardener, but and man, in, in those climates, like you have to have the correct system set up. Like she had yeah. a whole water catchment thing and, you know, just all the rainwater would recirculate back into her garden and she had a whole enclosure and it was phenomenal, but it's That's definitely, the dream. yeah, it's a whole system that you have to really cultivate. It's, it's not like, oh, let me just plant this and it'll be completely fine. So yeah, that was, yeah. that was something I would have loved to have gotten into, but it definitely felt like too much to tackle. Yeah. And, you know, gardening is always kind of put forth as one of the easiest things we can do, grow your own food. And on top of all the things I just mentioned, I will say, like, it's not so easy. Like, the things don't always grow. They they don't always pollinate. And you get vine borer. Or you get all these different critters. And I was trying to do it, you know, without chemicals. And it was like, it was challenging. So you, you would think, yeah, you just plant it in the groundwater and it grows. But it doesn't always do that. So I was just like, if I was feeding myself, I would have, you know, screwed because... <laughs> If I was just depending on my own garden, I don't know. But. Uh, I don't know about where you were, if they have this, but where I was in Arizona, they were trying to encourage that kind of thing. But understanding that water resources are very scarce and there's things you can do that are helpful. So um, the city actually had a bunch of community classes that they would host. And it, part of it helped with actually installing yeah. some of these systems like your like water retention and, and water catching systems um, and like how to use it all and how to actually get these things set up. So for all of you would be <laughs> gardeners out there, there may be community resources you're not aware of that can help get started on that journey. Um, I think without that local level gardener knowledge, it, it can be difficult, but oftentimes there are supports to help with that. But you, you know, again, know that they're out there, you know, or you might not sure. be with them. So um yeah, the yeah. community support again can really help with that with that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, great point. I had some friends that definitely helped me get going, but um, since it was COVID, I couldn't really uh, yeah. do That's much of the hands-on stuff. And and I, you know, there's always more you can learn, right? So I could definitely have probably done more, but um, yeah, that was just what I could do at the time. So well, listen, great. You'll have to come out and see. <laughs> yeah, I would like to get like a tiny, like one basil plant. I just want to grow one basil plant. <laughs> so Jennifer, you're gonna have to come out here. <laughs> Okay, I'll figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, did you have anything else you wanted to throw out as a quote unquote fail or just frustrating environmental <laughs> activity? Oh, no, I just, as I'm listening to both of you throughout our conversation today, I feel like I'm hearing the same kind of themes come up, even though we've switched topics multiple times. So I feel like um, maybe that's just worthy of pointing out that having community support, having local and state government mm -hmm. regulate and make policy around a lot of these things, you know, keeps ding, ding, ding in my ear as we're talking that, you know, that's probably something that would be really helpful for, yeah. for a lot of these. But I just don't want anyone to get discouraged because it can definitely feel sometimes like no matter how much you do, it's not enough. And all that matters and all of it counts. And mm -hmm. it's these little steps that everybody takes that move things forward. It just also does highlight that a lot of these topics are more nuanced than maybe we tend to think of them or have been taught to think of them over time. 
you know, and that's just something to be aware of and try to make change with. Yeah, we didn't create the problems by ourselves, but then we're expected to solve them by ourselves by recycling and doing all these individual actions. <laughs> Social issues, right? Oh. Say, um, like a helpful green tip, though, if it's if it's that time. Uh, not quite. Well, I was going to see if Chris had anything else she wanted to throw out there for. Our... Sure. Yeah. Uh, one more and thing. Then we'll get to the. <laughs> And then we can do green light. Remind me when you said recycle bins. I was like, oh, I have an idea. I got all excited. <laughs> uh, yeah. So about um, God, 10 years ago, <laughs> uh, that makes me feel old. Um, I got it in my head that we needed to sell our house. We had like a very suburban type house. It was like under 1900 square feet and everybody had a bathroom and all that stuff. Um, and it just, I started realizing that, you know, there were spaces in the house that we weren't using and I got really into the tiny house movement and YouTube. Um, and in June of that year, we had sold our house and a good chunk of our stuff, like by the last week of us living in that house, we were like sitting on the floor, all of our matches were on the floor. Um, my kids were really little at the time. So that was to our benefit. Um, and we moved into a trailer for three months at a trailer park. And it was awesome. It was so much fun. It was so cool. Um, we had about 200 and something square feet for the four of us plus a dog. And it was one of the best summers of my whole life. And it was amazing. And then we're like, okay, we're going to do it next summer. It's going to be great. We only have a couple summers to do this because at the time my daughter was seven and my son was five. And we rented a, a house a little cottage that was significantly bigger than the trailer. Um, and one day Ray was like, let's go out, let's go for a drive. I'm like, okay, that sounds great. And we came across this cottage that was right on the lake. Jen's been there. Um, and we bought it and it was like, yes, cause tiny house living, it's cheaper, it's better. We're skirting around the, the building codes because the smallest dwelling you could build in our area was 935 square feet and we're like we don't need all that space um so we moved into a cottage on the lake and it was about 620 square feet and over the next six years my husband and I proceeded to gut it renovate it um and we I hated it <laughs> I didn't like it about a few weeks after we moved in two weeks after we moved in we were hit with a massive blizzard that shut everything down for about a week and my husband got stuck at work twice uh once for 42 hours and once for over 24 and the house the cottage was sold as four seasoned it was not it was very cold mm -hmm. uh that first electric bill I cried um, because that's not this, that's not the story I was sold. And once I started adding things up, I'm like, it is more expensive to live here than it was our old house when I tallied everything up and I was heartbroken, but I'm like, we're here now. <laughs> Let's try to friggin' make it work. Um, and there were, there were good times. Like, I'm glad that we did it because it helped us with, uh, paring down our things. There's only so much you can fit into 620 square feet. So you become very selective about what you bring in your home. And I've carried that on through our house now. Um, and living that close to the water was really great. Um, we got to see coyotes and bald eagles, snowy owls and stuff. My kids could find salamanders and our dog loved it. She would go out in the lake and swim to the point of exhaustion. You'd have to hold her up and she'd get mad because you were holding her <laughs> up. She still wanted to swim. Um, she passed away out there. It was beautiful. You know, she loved it out there. Um, but after a while, you're like, this This was a bit of a money pit. <laughs> this was not what I thought it was supposed to be. And at that time, nobody had said anything bad about tiny house. Like, there was no cons to the tiny house movement. Like, van life, tiny house movement, all that stuff was still very starry-eyed, and it's a dream, and this is what everybody should be doing. And I feel like it is if you have, like, in a city, when you need to get creative with where you're living, I think it's an awesome option um, houseboats. That would be very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, also you have two kids. So I have two kids. I don't know how you did it for that long. <laughs> well, when they were little and then when the pandemic hit, um, it suddenly became too small and the walls closed in on me and there was no space. And at that time they were like, 
you know, you're going to have to store like a month's worth of food. I'm like, where am I going to store a month's worth of food? <laughs> like, where the heck is that going to happen? Um, and we started looking and we found the place we're in now. And it's still like it's only it's under 1700 square feet. Um, very manageable for us. The yard's very manageable. Everybody's got their own room still. Everybody still had their own room at the cottage. Um, but we're not on top of each other. And my kids are 17 and almost 15 now, right? So I couldn't imagine still living there with two full-grown teenagers <laughs> or taller than me and s- still having kind of like a harmonious home life. I don't know how that would be possible. But had we started younger and had our kids in the tiny house while we were still there, I feel like we could have lived there for longer. I think small living and and things like that is sort of, it's a lot easier when it's just you or two people. Um, And and young kids, it's a lot easier with young kids. The older they get, the more it's like, oh, somebody needs some privacy. Somebody's getting annoyed with their brother and somebody (laughs) is, you know. But it is great when you have housing problem issues. It's fantastic when there's... um, when I know like Vancouver is one of the most, Vancouver and Toronto are two of the most expensive cities in the entire world to live in. And so you have to get creative if you need to live there. Um, it would be great if, if building codes would allow for small dwellings under 900 square feet, because 900 is still a lot of, a lot of footprint, right? Um, but yeah, but I wish I would have been a little bit more pragmatic, a little bit less starry-eyed, a little bit more like, because Ray's so supportive. He's just like, sure, Beth, let's do it. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. And he learned a lot too. We learned so much. I'll never regret it. But I think I, it, it's not for everybody. And you, it's it's um, not something you could do forever, especially if your life starts changing, you had children. Um, we could downsize after the kids leave. But right, right now it's living in a tiny home. Like I've got dagger eyes for my daughter. She's like, uh, absolutely not. <laughs> like, no. Chris, I just have to say, I admire your like willingness to just go all in on these huge lifestyle changes, like <laughs> veganism and tiny home living. Cause you do, you just like, I'm going to do it and you try it. And if it doesn't work, <laughs> that's okay. But like, I love that about you. You just like, you're down to try yeah. it out. <laughs> and it looks like, thank you. I, and, Dude, I'm very down with the way you moved to Ireland. I thought that was pretty boss. Oh. <laughs> but like I told Ray, I'm like, this must look nuts to other people. Like we just one day woke up and decided let's sell all of our stuff. Except there was like a eight month conversation and research and stuff like that that went into it. But we didn't tell anybody. <laughs> and then the for sale sign went out and our parents are looking at us like, what? <laughs> My father-in-law called his trailer trash one time. <laughs> we were living out the trailer. He's like, what are you doing? Oh, like, but it was, uh, it was the best time ever and the fact mm-hmm. that they were that small made it that much more magical yeah so it was beautiful but not long-term sustainable mm-hmm. at all for a family like us yeah I have to say I think I've mentioned this on the show before I also have harbored guilt about like having too much stuff mm-hmm. um, I uh, wouldn't call myself a full-blown hoarder, but I definitely have (laughs) attachment issues to things. And I was not the person who decided to move overseas and sell all my stuff. I packed it all up into a storage unit and it doesn't even all fit. Like some of it's at my parents' house now. So (laughs) like, um, and I got rid of quite a bit of furniture, but yeah, I just like, I don't know. I, I think part of it's my personality and part of it's how I was raised, but I just have a lot of books and um, sentimental things and um, stuff. But, you know, I also don't feel as guilty because a lot of my stuff was bought secondhand. Yeah. So I'm not contributing to new waste. I'm actually helping to reduce, you know, what's already out there in my mind anyways. Um, So that's one of those things that I've just kind of accepted, you know, maybe this is you know, not the, I'm not going to go full blown on this, but I I am going to compromise by buying used and by Mm -hmm. like reusing what I have. Um, but yeah, I don't think I could even live in like a 900 square foot home by myself. Like, (laughs) (laughs) um, just me. That is, um, my sister actually told me, you know, we were talking about minimalism and how that's never going to be us. And she said, there's a term called maximalism. Have you guys heard this? And she's like, I think that's what we are. Cause we, we don't like, like, I admire the minimalist look Mm -hmm. without the clutter and everything, but I also just like having like 
my things and being cozy and having decor yeah. on the wall and, you know, access to pictures and all that stuff. So I think, I think that's what I am and I'm going to just go with that and be okay with that's that. Awesome. Right? Yeah. Also books don't count as stuff. Oh yeah. Can I just say that? Oh, books, okay. okay. Books are like, can never go wrong with books. I want all the books. <laughs> yeah. Kristen, I got to say, I'm very impressed at the amount of purging that you must have had to do for that. It was fun. I'm it sounds like a lot. Like when I was in Arizona preparing for the Ireland move, I mean, it got delayed a little bit for the pandemic. So I ended up spending about two years in like a very slow purge, mm -hmm. big house. And then I had a lot of friends who had moved. And so then they gave me all their stuff and it was an as is. So I had all of the previous owner's stuff in there too. And it was just a lot of stuff. Yeah. And some of that was wonderful. I got a lot of really cherished things out of it. And a lot of it was just, I need to thin things out. You know, I have stuff from college 10 years ago, that's still lingering. I have stuff that I, you know, clothes from when I was 14. And you notice, I never really done a, a deep purge. And not that I still can't thin some things out, because I definitely can. But the move to Ireland, and then the place that I'm living now in California is much smaller than I'm where I was in Arizona. And being able to thin those things out, I now have room for the things that I actually care about having around me because mm -hmm. I can see them and access them. And even when I had a larger home, there was just so much stuff that those things weren't even, they were all in boxes and closets and I never got mm -hmm. to them. So I have found that by purging, I'm able to actually have that stuff around me that I want to have around me. But that's yeah. what I to do. Yeah, we've never stayed in it. My aunt just went through her whole house. Now she's lived there for 27 years. And she's like, don't, don't things accumulate? I'm like, we haven't stayed in a house long enough for that kind of accumulation to happen. But it's, we're, we're not, we're sentimental with certain things, but most, and same with the kids. Um, they're not totally sentimental. So I, I like maximalism. I like minimalism. We're mediumists, you know, like there's, there's <laughs> intentional things, but I love my decor. I love putting, I love showing off our nerdiness and stuff like that and books and whatnot. And same with the kids too. But like, yeah, there's something to be said for, for our overconsumption of stuff because we did have a storage locker when we, when we did do tiny, we did, we had a small one with things that we thought we might would need later, like a dining room table and uh, some of the kids toys because they wouldn't fit in the trailer. Um, but Yes, yeah, sometimes stuff's fun. <laughs> Let me ask you guys something. Um, since you've kind of been through this a couple of times, like when you have to purge or get rid of things, do you find it stressful to to do it in a responsible way? So, like, what I mean is, part of minimalism, right, is using less. Well, to use less, we have to get rid of stuff. But then I don't want to just throw it away, and I don't want to. If I spent good money on it, I don't want to get nothing for it. Sometimes I want to sell it, and so that can be a process because. If you've ever sold anything on the marketplace, you know how much fun that is. Um, or if there's a consignment shop, you might do that. But like you you can donate some things or some things that they won't take. So to me, it's like anxiety inducing figuring out where can I get this where it will actually get used and it won't get thrown away or or the person who needs it the most can use it. And then that becomes like awful for me. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> I don't think about it that much. We had a deadline and <laughs> it was like it. If stuff's still in the house by then, it's getting donated. We sold as much as we could in the short amount of time. We had three weeks. So it was, this is it. It's selling cheap. I sold something that Ray had made. Oh, and I sold it really cheap. It got a little irritated. I mean, he's like, that, the wood costs more than what you just sold it for. I'm like, I know what I needed to leave. I'm sorry. And our friend who bought it still has it. So that's kind of cool. But um, if it's a yeah. friend, it's a little easier it's a as little well. But. Thought, but um, yeah, like I like purging. I like organizing. It's like one of my things that I enjoy doing. So it's it's fun for me to take a space that feels like there's too much in it, pare it down. Um, but I don't need a lot of stuff. I don't have a lot of patience to sell things unless I feel like this has got some sort of monetary value. Most of the time, I just donate it. I can't. I have no patience, unfortunately, to do that like two years of slow purging dude like that's i don't dude, know I do that. i'm listening to you talk i'm like you are a superhero you have actual <laughs> magical powers <laughs> i yeah jennifer i think i'm a little bit more on your track <laughs> with that kind of thing um i have huge sentimental attachment to pretty much everything that i've ever come across so <laughs> i have a lot of difficulty with letting things go i'm a, i am a little bit of a pack rat but i don't like 
my space to feel that way. It's just a habit that's difficult in me. Yeah. So what I found was really helpful was all of the stuff, especially clothes that, you know, cause sometimes people give you things and they're not your style or they don't fit right. But this person that I really love gave it to me. So I can never part with it forever. I have a lot of stuff like that. So I discovered once I took all those things that I felt like I don't need to have this in my life, I would be a little too heartbroken to actually get rid of it that day. Like that's already enough emotional labor for one day or a week or however long it took to fill this bag with the stuff. And I realized if I just put that in a corner and let it sit for a while, whether that was a couple of weeks or a couple of months, depending on what other purging I had going on, once I came back to it and felt like I had enough stuff for a car load to drive out to Goodwill, by that point, I felt like I'd been able to emotionally disconnect from it and I could part with it. I just couldn't do it all in that same space of yeah. time. That's awesome. So, that's like a, yeah, really, that's that's a fantastic that's idea. Fun. And then even just like you were saying with this piece that your husband had made that now you know the person who has it and they appreciate it. That was hugely helpful to me too because I realized a lot of these things, I want to be treasured. I want them to have a, a new life where they're appreciated and cared for. And I wasn't able to give that to those items. And knowing that they were going somewhere where they were going to have that made it so much easier to part with a lot of those items. I think that's my problem too, is like, if I don't know, it's going to go to someone who values it like I did or would have, if I, you know, like you said, could have given, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I kept it. Um, like that was hard for me when I sold my house, right? I had it for 10 years. I had put a lot of work into it. I had done all these little things, these quirky things and okay. built all those garden beds. And that was my big thing. I was like, I want someone who's going to keep gardening. And it sounds so stupid, but the, the amount of work I put into it and the amount of time and, and just like, I don't know, I just felt like if you value these the pear trees that I planted and all these little things, then I know you're the one. And I don't know. No, look at it you. It was hard. So yeah. I, Take that and like reduce it to everyday objects, and space. it's tough. It's it's honestly oh, yeah. it's tough to part with these things. Um, I also don't really have a lot of patience for the selling them thing. I have tried some of those like individual marketplace apps, and I just felt like it was a lot of work for not a lot of return, and the shipping prices compared to how much you're selling it for. I made I think like a dollar thirty yeah. on something, and like it just to me it was so much more time and energy and I, it wasn't making sense monetarily. And I'm also the time you put into it. Yeah. It wasn't worth it. So I, I'm sure that that works amazingly for some people. And I would love to hear from them if they have <laughs> <laughs> That'd be better, but for me, it's definitely more of a, a donate or, you know, trade with other friends. You know, I just had someone recently downsize her home. And so she had me come to her house and sift through her closet and just have a shopping spree in her closet. And now I have like an entire new wardrobe of her yeah. clothes. So, you know, so I'd rather do something like that, I feel like, than, I don't know, try to make a profit off yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. No, but I those like aren't that. good items either. I'm sure if I had something, like, really valuable, I would maybe try to, I, I don't know. I, I've if, gotten more picky with, like, I only try to sell things that I think are going to be worth the trouble because the back and forth or, like you said, the shipping prices, um, I've gotten burned on that a few times where I thought it would cost this much and then it was more. So yeah, I think you just kind of learn you know, after doing it a few times, like this is worth it. This isn't or whatever, but, <laughs> um, well, real quick, before we move on to our green life hack, I did have one more thing. I wanted to kind of get Chris's input on this. Um, okay. Since you guys have an EV. Yes. And we do. I, I recently, um, got to rent a Tesla and uh -huh. drive it to uh -huh. South Texas for a wedding <laughs> with your husband, <laughs> <Yep>. um, <laughs> who helped me learn how to actually use it because, <laughs> You know, it's confusing. Um, so my experience with the EV was I liked it. It was fun, but um, it was obviously a hassle having to stop to charge it and wait an hour. And this was a Tesla that had superchargers. So that was like fast charging mm -hmm. um, to get a full charge. Um, so obviously the infrastructure is not fully there for, you know, a lot of long term travel. We were lucky that our route had like enough places to stop that we didn't have to go out of our way. Um, but EVs are becoming a big, you know, staple of the environmental movement and, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to see more and more of them. So as a longtime EV user, I'm just, you know, wanting to get your your input on the good and the bad, because I think we all are kind of feeling the pressure that your next car needs to be an EV. But like, again, yeah, how accessible is that for people? And is there charging available? Blah, blah, blah. Exactly. So I feel like this is a rush 
to prove something without actually thinking about the details that go into it. Because our in North America, our our transportation system isn't set up for this. It's not. And so uh, I know the Canadian government said by 2030, they're not going to produce, there's no more new gas vehicles anymore. No, no combustion engines. And while that sounds very wonderful and altruistic, it's like, right, but uh, <laughs> there's nowhere to charge these suckers. Um, winter here reduces the battery longevity like per use. So like in the summertime, we can get like over 400, I work in kilometers, not miles. I have no idea the conversion. Uh, so we can get over 400 kilometers, but in the winter time, we're under 300 because of the, mm. the heating needed, right? And it's colder, so the batteries don't work as well. Um, so we, my husband loves cars, massive gearhead. Um, he did, uh, we've wanted an EV for years. And so he did almost a whole year of research and then his car, he, he ran into a deer. So we had to, <laughs> like it was one of those things where he totaled his car. He used to drive a little mini Cooper and the way he hit the deer thing, he was fine. It only, anyways, it, the deer died, but it, anyways, that's besides uh-huh. the point. I digress. Um, we needed to get a new car and it was like, okay, let's see. The federal government here has a 3,000 five thousand five thousand dollar rebate there are a lot of incentive programs that way but our provincial government in his infinite wisdom took away our provincial rebate which would have been three thousand dollars so we could have gotten an additional eight thousand dollars off our car but we didn't we only got five which is still great evs are still expensive um that it's it was a lot of math on our part to figure out, okay, we're not doing oil changes. There's, there's no stuff like that way that we don't have to do. However, it's a higher pay car payment. Um, we also put in a, a charger in our house too. We did a level mm-hmm. two. So there's three different levels, level one, which is basically just plug it into an outlet. And like three days later, your car is charged, <laughs> uh, level two, which takes, um, so if he goes, It's like from zero to full, it takes about nine hours. So we do it overnight. And then the fast charger, which is 80%, which can happen in like 40 minutes, depending on where we are. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like driving a spaceship. That thing's got guts. Holy crap. Like It's like, so it's a little like, Ooh, we're driving fast here. Um, (laughs) The braking system's a lot different. It's Mm -hmm. still, we've had it almost for two years and it's still like, the regenerative braking, yeah. Yeah, the regenerative braking is very interesting. Um, Ray drives it every single day to to and from work. Where he works, he's lucky enough there are charging stations there. Um, so if he can get one, he plugs the car in. Um, but again, we have one here. If we ever decide to get rid of the EV, it can be used uh, for welding and stuff. It's like one of, anyway. Um, yeah, and that's the other thing. Yeah. Like, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's greener in some ways because you're not burning gas. But what if the electricity is coming from coal or natural yeah, gas or something? Area, I yeah, mean, if you're in an area that, that has that, we have, um, we have a mix of things. It's mostly nuclear here. But, um, yeah, it just depends. The infrastructure is just not there it's just not there. And I don't know how it's going to be there. in like, was it like seven years for their big plans to get rid of all of the, the gas powered engines and stuff. It's, it's a lot, they're expensive. It's not convenient at all. If you're doing long hauls. Now, if you just need a little commuter car, it's fantastic. It's mm-hmm. awesome. Um, but if you're doing like Ray drives 150 kilometers every day, five days a week. So it, it was, it was like, we need and they're only starting to now have longevity in their battery life. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, um, and then there's trucks too. We have a neighbor of ours and he loves his mm-hmm. truck and they have a, a property in Northern Quebec, which is about eight hours away from us. And that's not doable in an EV. Um, there's no towing capability with that too. They're starting to come out with stuff like that. Battery life is starting to get better. Um, but we're still so far away from it being like really, the go-to thing, like the easy choice, much like solar, yeah. right? Still, there's so much, so many hoops to go through. It's a great start. We've had it, my neighbor who's 82 came over and started chit-chatting with Ray about it all. And it's the wave of the future. And we're like, yeah, it is. It's awesome. Um, we'd love it. We wouldn't trade it in for the world. Like I said, we've wanted one for years, but there is, it's not available to 
everybody yet. Yeah. And I and don't know how it's going to be. That yeah, that's my thing is like um it's it's definitely needed and I'm yeah. not, definitely not trying to discourage anyone from doing no, no, no. it. I guess I'm just thinking, you know, think it through yes. and take all of the things you just said into consideration because a lot of times the lived experience is different from what you hear. Yes. I want my next car to be an EV or a hybrid mm-hmm. at the very least, but a lot of that will depend on where I'm living and whether there's infrastructure and um yeah, if if I'm getting power from something renewable or whatever cuz yeah, there's all that. But the good thing is, uh, you know, the U.S. just passed the IRA, which gives some incentives for mm-hmm. certain EVs produced in the U.S. There's a lot of strings attached to that, so you yeah. have to do some research. But there are some incentives popping up, and some states have their own. So I guess look into that if money is, is a factor as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah. yeah, I think we're, we're definitely a long ways away from it being the, the standard. <laughs> oh, yeah, really far away. I think hybrids are great. I think that should have been the next step. Um, and then make it electrical just because, yeah, our infrastructures, our road infrastructure is just not set. Like we have a fast charger in town, um, that Ray's used a few times, um, when he's forgotten to plug in the car. That's the other thing you have to remember to plug in your oh, car yeah. too mm-hmm. at night. Uh, yeah. And there's, you know, it's really cool. It's very gadgety, um, which is really cool. Um, our, our daughter just got her. G1, which is like a learner's equivalent, and she's learning on both the gas and the electric. Very different drive for both, so I don't know which one she prefers yet. Um, but yeah, it's definitely you have to. It's a lot of pros and cons list about whether it's worth worth well, it. Well, that that was something else I didn't like about the Tesla is all the controls are on a screen and. Yeah it's very distracting. Like you talk about texting is, is distracted driving. If you yeah. have to look at the screen to change anything, I mean, you can do it voice commands with some, but you have to know what to say. Um, and to me, like if I'm just driving a gas car or whatever, I can reach over and turn mm-hmm. the air on. I know where to go. Yeah. I feel versus I'm having to physically take my eyes off the road. That's kind of yeah. dangerous too. <laughs> it, it is. And I, I, when we were looking, I was like, there has to be analog things on this car mm-hmm. I can't have everything be touch screen because I'm you know it's only so I can't look at two things at once mm-hmm. right um so it, it has to be it has to have some analog analog yeah. features so thankfully our heating um our heating is and um there's controls on the steering wheel too but the mm-hmm. but everything else is like and it, there's buttons and stuff like that too and there is a touch screen but yeah, a lot of it can be done through analog. He's shown me some prototypes that are coming out. I'm just like, that looks like a car accident waiting to happen. You have a giant computer screen yeah. in your car now. You have no buttons, nothing's analog, and everything's – how is that safe? And then don't get me started on automatic drive, like self-automated cars. That freaks <laughs> me out. I'm not, oh. Honestly, oh, I have – more faith in those and less faith in the people who are in them. Mm -hmm. The people I know who have like the full automated, they'll use it for, you know, two hour commutes to work. They'll take a nap. Yeah. Their nails. They'll do it. Never trust it. Please don't do that. Like that's, I think it's (laughs) so great that all of these automated systems can help detect. Like if you're swerving in your lane, you know, they can, they can Mm -hmm. out a lot. And I think that that's really wonderful. And it's not an excuse to not pay attention to mm-hmm. where you are, like, physically in space. Like, yeah. you still need to be responsible. Yes. So, oh, yeah. my gosh. We're like, oh, yeah, I had a great nap on my way to work today. I'm like, no, no. Like, that's not what <laughs> this is for. Don't not the minority works. report. Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. It freaks me out. We're not there yet. Not even well, remotely. Even when we were driving and I had it on cruise control, um, it has this smart cruise control where it can it can tell when to slow down Mm -hmm. so you don't have to turn it off and on, which is cool because if you're, you know, not paying attention as well, or you just, somebody starts to slow down, it'll slow down for you. But then if somebody turns in front of you really fast, like turning left and you're going straight and you can tell like visibly there, you have enough space, you're fine. The car would sometimes slam on the brakes because it didn't, it didn't see that. Mm -hmm. And so that could cause an accident because the person behind you could run into you because you slam on your brakes, but you actually had plenty of space. You know what I mean? So yeah. the car isn't as yeah good at self-driving as they would have you think. But. No, yeah, we have that in our, we have a Kona and um, we have that uh, cruise control assist. And it is nice. I don't have it on my car, um, but it is nice. But then when, 
the car in front of you turns, whatever. All of a sudden it kicks back in a cruise and you're like oh, shoved back because yeah. then the car takes off to rear. where it was set before. So, yeah. 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 Well, it's, it's always good to have, yeah, the pros and cons of everything. Mm-hmm. And hopefully it'll become more accessible, like you said. But um, in the meantime, just things to think about for those. Yeah looking to transition. I think it will be like, I know Chris, you had said that that's been mandated now to phase out new gas vehicles. The same mm-hmm. thing's done in California, which is a huge market for car manufacturers. And mm-hmm. that's really difficult if you're going to have to manufacture a different standard of cars, California yeah. versus the rest of the States. So typically they'll just adjust it to make the market fit for everybody. So eventually I think that will become easier to get the infrastructure to where it needs to be and easier for that to be the standard. And I mean, it's all a work in progress. I think over mm-hmm. time we get there. I have heard some issues with pure electric, you know, not the hybrid option with mountains and things having a much reduced battery life if the terrain is a lot steeper. So there's definitely things to think about. I, there's mm-hmm. situations like that where I've heard my friends say, hey, I wish we had a hybrid in this situation mm-hmm. instead just so we have this fallback. So it's definitely a work in progress, but I feel like we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have some concerns over you know, sustainable acquisition of some of the materials used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's also something that's been brought up and companies I know are really trying to address that. So it's not lost in the vacuum somewhere, but that's another area I would like to see a lot of focus on as we kind of make these transitions. Yes. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, it's really fast to start doing all these, making all these mandates like this will happen. This will happen. It's like, right. But like, there's a lot of cogs in the wheel here that we got to figure out first before we make this big declaration and yeah like the mining of the lithium and things like that definitely have to consider how it's being done to get these batteries (laughs) into these cars i do want things to move that fast because i have so much stress and anxiety (laughs) it should have been done 40 years ago now move faster so (laughs) i do want that to move quickly but yes not so quickly that we're incurring additional environmental costs (laughs) you know making one problem worse to solve another. Yeah. That's my only hesitancy for like, maybe just like make sure this one area is, is addressed. Mm-hmm. Other than yeah. that, I'm like, let's just deal with it and move forward. We have to do things. So. Yeah. It's like you said, anything we do is going to have <laughs> some kind of problem. It seems like, and, and it oh feels gosh. impossible. Sometimes it feels that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you ladies for sharing your experiences and hopefully this helps others, you know, realize that, if they're struggling with some of these things or have, you know, just things they're thinking of trying out, um, that these, this kind of gives them some perspective. And, and like you said at the beginning, we're not trying to discourage anyone from doing any of these things. We still believe in personal action and trying because if we all just stop trying as individuals, that wouldn't be good either. Um, it does take incremental action, but we also have to recognize that we need action at a higher level. Um, businesses, governments, etc. So um, on that note, I guess we'll move on to our green life hacks. And um, mine is kind of a two part to piggyback off of what I was just saying. Um, You know, continue doing the best you can. Don't try to do everything perfectly, as we've said, because that's impossible. And I think we all suffer from that guilt of I'm never doing enough. There's always more that I could be doing. But I guess mine would just be to kind of challenge yourself to think about, like, I only have a limited amount of time and energy to to focus on this. So where can it be best spent? So like I read an article years ago that was like, is it more effective for me to spend 10 minutes cleaning out this peanut butter container to be recycled or, or not, maybe? Or should I, you know, call my congressman in that 10 minutes? If you only have 10 minutes to do a, you know, do something for the environment. Um, just try to frame it in that way. Like is me doing this one individual thing more effective or, um, you know, maybe I could be getting more active being politically or volunteering for a cause or voting or something like that. So I guess, yeah, just trying to think of ways that we can get, um, apply pressure to these systems we've talked about, or even writing a letter to a company that makes something you like and say, Hey, I would love it if you made this in a more sustainable packaging or, where do you source this from or whatever? Um, yeah. So trying to kind of put pressure on those systems. Um, and the other thing I was just going to say is I just finished a book that our, re- our listeners may be interested in um, called the ministry for the future by Kim Stanley Robinson. And it is, it, there, there are some dark moments in it because it's about 
our future with climate change, etc. But um, it is, as he says, like a utopian novel. It's a sci-fi, but it's not a dystopian. So it does kind of have a hopeful note to it. So if you're interested in a, you know, cli-fi novel that's not completely depressing. Um, it's, I love yeah. that cli-fi. I haven't heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, climate that. fiction. So that's that's my uh, green life hacks. And Rachel, I know you you had something you want to throw out there. So do you want to join us? You guys. All right. So I am now living in the second place I've ever lived that offers a composting option as part of the waste bin city pickup. Um, I'm very <laughs> excited about it. But since I'm still kind of new to that being an option, it just has been a bit of a struggle bus. Um, I had that when I was in Ireland, loved it, except that I feel like every other day you're taking it out and <laughs> things get moldy. I would always line the little compostable bag with bread because then I put my eggshells in there and then it like starts to disintegrate the bag, but then the bread gets moldy. And like, I was very, very happy to have that option. And it was also like a lot of regular upkeep. Um, <laughs> Speaking so, of environmental actions that are difficult. <laughs> right. You're like, I'm very pleased to be doing this. And also I, I need to like train Sports. myself a good way to do it. So I, you know, had just, I just very recently moved and was trying very hard to start myself off with good practices and not just bring in a lot of things into my new home because they were easy and convenient. I really wanted to set myself off on the right foot that I, that I wanted to be on. And so I was kind of struggling with, oh my gosh, what am I going to, what am I going to do about the compost option? I don't have a, a place. I don't have a little bin to put it, but the option is here where I'm living. And, um, a friend of mine said, well, why don't you just stick it in your freezer? And I just had such an aha moment of, of course, why would I not stick it in my freezer? But it hadn't occurred to me. So I have a little plastic tub and has a little lid with clasps, although she doesn't use that for hers. I do for mine because that's what I have. Um, and I love it because I like things to be a little extra bougie. I put a little newspaper down on the bottom, but you don't even need to do that. You just chuck all your eggshells and your matches and all of your lettuce bits put them in your little bin, close the freezer door, man, I can go weeks without emptying that thing. The only reason I empty it is when it gets full. There's no stinkiness or grossness level that ever drives me to feel like I need to take this out. And then when I take it out, it's one ice block and it just dunks out in one chunk and it is so clean. It is smell free. There's no mold or other things growing. Like it is just has been such a game changer. And I, you know, Maybe other people aren't as excited about compost bins as I am, but this has really just made me feel like I'm doing this properly now. Like you so, found the hack to beat the system. <laughs> well, it just makes it easier. It is. Like I, I would have never thought of that. And I've been composting for years and using a little container that gets kind of gross and smelly. But I was just like, well, just hurry up and do it. Before I, close, I know. I was always it. scrubbing the other bin like with soap and having to air dry it and then putting baking powder like in between or baking soda in between uses to try to just keep it feel clean, like feeling cleaner. And now I'm just like, man, you're going to do it more and use it more if it's easier. So that's what I would advise everyone make use of your freezers and, you know, keep your eyes and ears open. I'm sure there's other easier ways to do things for other things in our lives too. So that's been a game changer for me. No, I love that. Um, Chris, what is your green life hack? Um, I can I compost here at the house, except we don't have a pickup. Um, but I did know about the freezer thing. Um, I just don't have any room in my freezer. <laughs> Um, so my green life half, and I'm pretty sure I've mentioned it before, but, um, meal plans and grocery lists, just huge when it comes to, um, avoiding things that, um, cause I have this, I, I was very hopeful about the things I was going to eat. I'm like, I'm totally going to eat this healthy thing. And then not cause I had no, but I had no plan for it. So it would just lovingly die in my fridge well, I look at it every time I open it, be like, I had no idea how to do this because I also have had to teach myself how to cook too. So meal plans, because everybody asks what's for dinner. So now I can just say it's right here. So I do that. Um, and then based off the meal plan, I make my grocery list and then I stick to the grocery list um, as much as humanly possible. Depends who I'm grocery shopping with. <laughs> Phrase with me. It always goes awry. Um, 
But uh, yeah, it's just, it's super helpful. It helps keep you on track. And especially with the rising cost of food, um, it, it keeps you from, it can help keep you from buying those things that you would impulsively buy, right? Like, oh, this sounds great. And then you just grab it and stick it in. It's like $10 and it is delicious. However, you didn't actually need to eat it and you didn't need to buy it. And so that's what, and I've been doing that for, for years, but I feel like grocery lists and meal plans are severely, severely underrated. Just good intention buys. I'm going to try to learn how to do something new tonight. And then mm. a week goes by and it's moldy. And <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. All the time, all the time. And then, yep. yeah, like the Seriously. kids, what's for dinner? I'm like, well, if your mom could cook, it would be this, but I can't. So it's this. <laughs> so instead of avoiding that or getting takeout or whatever, it's, it's the meal, it's the meal plan. And I just tell everybody to refer to that. And if they don't yeah. like, they're old enough now, if they don't like it, they can make whatever they want. Yeah. No, that's a good one. And there's apps and websites and oh, all there's sorts of stuff to help with that. <laughs> yes. But don't know where to start. Yeah. Don't ever underestimate the power of a grocery list. Yep. Well, that is our show for the day. Thank you again, ladies, for being on. And um, before we go, if you'd like to share where you can be found online, feel free to do so. Rachel, I have a feeling you probably are going to stay <laughs> anonymous, right? I do like to keep my settings private. You are okay. correct. However, if I've cultivated some kind of bizarre cult following from this conversation, however <laughs> unlikely they may be, Jennifer, I'm sure you can provide a conduit for that. Yes. Feel free to reach out to me. <laughs> um, Chris, where can we find you online? Um, you can find me here and at our parent show, Epically Geeky, um, Marginally Geeky and Creatively Geeky, and on Instagram at Moody Midlife. All right. And you can find me here, of course, sometimes on Epically and Marginally Geeky and on Instagram and Twitter at Het's Gonna Be Me. Um, you can find the show on all social media platforms, YouTube and anywhere you listen to podcasts. So please subscribe, share, like, give us a rating, whatever they let you do. Help us get the word out and um, let your friends know. If you have ideas for topics or guests, um, also feel free to send that our way. Thank you for listening and have a great rest of your day.